Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the session. Namaste, to me. Namaste, everybody. Thank you for being so consistent with the study session. We will move towards uh, the last chapter for today, rather for this uh, entire session, but I don't think we'll be able to finish it. Let's see how we go. Yeah. So let's close our eyes. Let's connect down to our palate. Inhale and exhale, relax the body. Feel yourself in the presence of our beloved teacher, Grand Masachua, in the presence of God. Thank you for everything that you have given us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Masachua Koksu, to Lord Mahaguruji Meling, to Buddha Kwanin, Buddha Sakyamuni, to Gautama Buddha, to the Lord Christ, to Lord Yehoswa Bamiriam, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, to all the great teachers, masters, and great beings of theosophy. We especially ask for the blessings of the beings of knowledge, light, and power, and also to the beings of communication, our respective internets and Wi-Fi connections. To our soul and divine self, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your knowledge, for your wisdom, for greater clarity and discernment, with deeper understanding, with with the ability to absorb and assimilate these teachings so we may have a greater understanding of who we are, what we need to do, so we may become better divine instruments in your service. Let thy will be done, not the urges of our lower nature. May my will be aligned to the will of my higher soul, to the will of my teacher, to the will of God. Let thy will be done. With your blessings, so be it. So be it, so be it, so it is. Be aware of the energy coming down into you. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale, share it with your family. Thank them for allowing you to be here. Inhale and exhale, share it with everyone who will be joining us. Inhale and exhale, share with the entire globe. We're all one. We're one with God, we're one with all. Slowly open your eyes with a smile. Atma, Namaste. Welcome everybody to today's session. So we're moving on to our last uh, topic for today. Uh, and um, let me go back to... So the big book um, is coming to an end. The last chapter is called The Result of Theosophical Study, right? And that's what we've been doing. And uh, the understanding of this particular chapter will be the end of this book. It's a culmination of all that we've been talking about for, for a while, right? And so uh, the chapter that we're going to look at is uh, from, again, the textbook of Theosophy. And so one of the things that we need to understand is that when we are trying to understand these teachings, right, the, the, the book that has given us so much information, one of the most important things that we all understand, uh, even with, uh, without Theosophy because of Master Chua's teachings, is that there is this amazing great being who we refer to as the Supreme Being, the Absolute. And the essence of that great being comes down further and further, manifesting in grosser and grosser matter. And so we are ultimately referring to only our solar system during the entire book study, right? And so from the solar deity, from Lord Savitru, from the sun god, Again, this energy continues to come down uh, to, to the level that we have been talking about till yesterday. And so the Supreme Being is basically the one that is directing the whole evolutionary process, this evolutionary process. And so we need to be aware of this evolutionary process that you and I are going through. And that to understand that this great Supreme Being is all wise, all loving, yes? And to understand if this whole plan is this great beings um, and this being is more intelligent than any person on the earth that you know of or any great being that we know of um, who has a particular name. This great being is much more than that. And so with all the intelligence, with all the love, 
there cannot be anything else but good that is supposed to come as we evolve. Yes. And that is something we also realize later that evolution is basically to see to it that you get the best in life and you can move forward as quickly as possible. But the other things we add on the way, right? But anyway, the first thing is to remember that this, there is this absolutely amazing, loving, great being that directs the whole process of evolution, right? And um, everything that exists in this entire scheme, yes, uh, is all working towards. So the second image is basically forward, that is progress. We're all going forward, regardless of what you and I do, whether you're listening to the session right now or uh, someone out there is playing a toy or someone is watching a movie, it doesn't matter. We're all evolving. We're all going in the same direction. Yes. So if there is someone in your family that's not willing to sit with you and do what you're doing, I'm not talking about the study session. I'm talking about your spiritual growth or your meditation. Let them be, right? Uh, we've got to remember that all of us are different um, souls. We understood that in yesterday's session where we realized that in the human race, right, in, in humanity, there are grades of people. And so these grades are not outside only. They're also in our family. They're also in the office space we work with. So you might have a certain person who's more evolved than the others. It's only because that person, that soul is more uh, what you call an old soul compared to the others. Yeah. So if there are people around you, let them be. They will move on their own in time because the process of evolution is to take you forward and there is a pressure that is constantly been given for us to move forward. All right. So finally, we have to remember that all of us are moving towards this. And so what is this thing that we're looking at? So the book says the final attainment of unspeakable glory is an absolute certainty for every son of man. So this is what is in store for us. Whether all of us will reach it, that's up to us. Yes, but the Supreme Being has given us that amazing goal. That is where we are all heading, right? Uh, so all the circumstances that surround you and me are intended to help us head to that amazing goal that uh, we're talking about at this point. So regardless of where we come from, it doesn't matter. If we can understand what these teachings are talking about, if we can make it part of our life, it will make a big difference to all of us. So one second before I move ahead, let me just do this though. You are all muted, just to be sure in between. Thanks. Okay. And so it says, um, the world, yes, that we are all in, the world, there is a lot of evil, uh, there's a lot of sorrow, and there's a lot of suffering that we tend to see. And we, we of course, all of us wonder, including this, um, this interesting world uh, pandemic that we're all going through. But to remember that it is only temporary and superficial. Yes, this is not lasting. It's, it's not something that's infinite and will go on and on. It will change. And hopefully, through this process, we all realize, understanding what we've understood so far, this is part of that plan. And so if this is part of that plan, we've been at home stuck for maybe in, in, in a couple of days, I think most of us will be at home for about 60 days. That's two months, uh, which has never happened in the life of our grandparents, in the life of our parents, and definitely not us. So there is a reason this is happening. If we can try and figure out what it is, and we're not talking about trying to figure out the global reason. We're talking about our own personal reasons. Why is this happening to us? It's not just uh, the globe that is going through this. It's also individually, each of us, in our own respective families, with our work, with the kind of things that we do, the city that we are in, the country that we are in. So one of the things that we, as, as people who are trying to understand these great teachings, one of the things that we all go towards is trying to see to it that we do not see life anymore like the ordinary person. But we hope to raise our consciousness to a higher degree. And why do we need to do this? So as man, as uh, an evolving soul, when I say man, so it says that we need to raise ourselves above it Yes, uh, to a higher level of thought and consciousness and look down upon it with eyes of the divine and understand that it is entirety. You have to understand it in, in the whole, yeah? Not as parts and not in bits and pieces. As its, as, it, at, as its entirety. So he can see that in the very truth that exists, yeah? 
not that all will be well at some remote period, but that even now at this moment, even in this time that we're having this pandemic, in the mis midst of incessant striving and apparent evil or suffering at this point in, in many parts of the world, the mighty current of evolution is still flowing. And so all is well because all is moving on in perfect order towards the final goal. So this, this whole thing and everything that will happen to us in, in the coming uh, months, years, uh, decades is part of this plan, yes? And so one of the things for us is to try and look at things from a higher perspective rather than on a lower perspective. And uh, we have to remember that it's very easy to get stuck in the egregor of what is happening around us and get stuck with the information from the television, from our, you know, our phones have so many things, people are forwarding so many messages to use your discernment to realize and recognize, hey, does this actually have some proper information that I need and that I could use to make my life better? The other is um, when we look at where we are all heading, to recognize that what we are going through right now is because of something we have created. Yes, the law of cause and effect. And at the same time, this whole thing is also happening for the law of evolution. Hopefully the evolution of our human race. Maybe this human race, what we've been doing hasn't been the right thing. And so we need to relook at how we've been behaving. Yes, how we've been talking and how we've been also thinking and keeping that in mind and also learning what we have learned so far. Can we change to become better? Yes. So um, it emphasizes deeply with all those we as, as, a, as a race, we do look at trying to see how we can become better, um, how we can become better in dealing with our own suffering, but also helping others in, suffer, in, in their suffering, right? So we realize that as human beings, we have to learn to help others around us, not hinder, whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, whether it's mentally or spiritually we should not hinder the progress of someone else, right? And so if we realize, say for example, someone comes up with a project and they, gives it, they give it to you and they say, can I do something about it? You need to figure out, is this person doing it purely for their own personal gain? Or is this person actually wanting to see that the whole, you know, the whole um, group that, that they're trying to connect to, it's actually going to raise that group's consciousness? Or is it going to do something to help or elevate the, pain and suffering or elevate the knowledge. And if you realize this person is doing that, we should really not hinder, right? Um, now, this is, this is not just with reference to physical hindrance, yes? When someone is trying to make a change in the house or in the office. Um, we're also talking about emotional change. And we're talking about also mental change. That could be with reference to making new plans, renewing, um, or not re-renewing, but re-looking at what already exists and saying, hey, you know what, this is too uh, ancient. We need to look at changing it. And also with spiritual advancement. Yes. So we have to see to it that we are not hindering others. That is something that we have to remember. And, and it is happening. People love to have the power to say, you know what, I can stop you from doing what you want. You have no idea what I can do. Right. So, so they won't say it, but the way they behave, you know, they love that power. Uh, they love to take control and they feel that only they know what is right and, and what needs to be done. And, and that's a little scary because those kind of people, I don't think I want to be around. Anyway, so, so in the study, right, one of the things that we do start to understand a lot more is that we start to uh, empathize with people right now who are affected by the COVID-19. Yes. And uh, we want to do things to help them, whether it's with reference to healing. If we know people who need healing, we're actually doing healing for them. There are a lot of foundation in, for example, in India, who have actually offered free healing to anybody who has uh, uh, a coronavirus or the COVID-19, the, the, their family members. Uh, the second is where we've all come together to try and do the meditation to enhance, to bless the whole earth, to heal her. And lastly, the great invocation, again, directed towards healing, right? So when we come together as groups to try and do this, we realize, yes, there are people suffering and I can't just sit here and say, okay, fine, it's their karma, but realize, hey, what can I do? And that's what I've seen Masachor do all through 
while he was around. Uh, so whether it was a tsunami that happened, whether it was an earthquake that happened, whatever it was, in a matter of few minutes, there would be an email. In those days, there were only emails that would be sent out globally saying that this is what I want you to do. I want you to do meditation, Twin Hearts. I want you to do great integration. I want you to bless, right? And of course, he would be more specific as to what, uh, and, and of course, there would be a target, whether it, it's, a, it's a particular city, a particular country that's been affected. And so he would be there ready to do this every time. And um, I remember once he left, you know, it's like, at least for me, um, I realized that um, I was a little lost. Uh, when things happened, I wasn't too sure. Uh, should I be doing it? Uh, obviously, Master Joseph not going to send me a message anymore. Uh, not at least in an email form. And so I was wondering, okay, should I do something? Should I keep uh, quiet? And so it took me a little while. I, I was a little dense even in my own head. And I realized, hey, you know what? The, especially in India, because we have something called the MCK Trust Fund. And, and as soon as there was a flood, say, in uh, Uttar Pradesh, or it was in Orissa, or West Bengal, or in Bangalore, wherever it was, we realized, hey, you know what? We need to give an avenue to people to do service. And it was amazing. As soon as you put that thing saying that, you know, relief fund for this, money would just flood in. I remember when the Nepal earthquake happened, we actually collected a, a, a sum of money to be sent across. But however, because of uh, government issues, that money is still stuck with us and we can't send it out. Nevertheless, the point is uh, you give an opportunity for people to do service. Now, let me remind you of one time when uh, there was what is called the Gujarat earthquake a long time ago. And I remember Master Chua called on me and he, I can't remember the exact amount, but he says to me, this is what I want you to give. Uh, tell at that time, the gentleman who was running the foundation there was called Dr. Mayank Shah. He sadly was a lovely, ama amazing person and left his body after a few years. And so I called on Dr. Uh, Mayank Shah and then I gave him all the uh, details and said, this is what Master Cho wants you to do. And so they started work going all around their entire state, uh, going to affected areas, giving what is required, whether it was blankets or food or whatever, taking pictures. And Master Cho came in January. And he asked me what happened. And then we had to show him the report with the photographs. And he says, okay, that's good. And he says, do they need anything more? And so we, we kind of um, got more information, gave it to master. Then when the tsunami happened, uh, which was much later, I remember he called on me. And at that point, I would actually be uh, one of the instructors who was teaching in uh, the country of Sri Lanka. And so he actually got me to send money there. And then he made me actually go and visit the places. So I actually had to go and visit to see, you know, what did we actually do there? You know, whether we provided a school with chairs and tables, uh, another place where we helped with other things, whether it was true food, whether it was construction, we went and saw, and it's, it's amazing to see how their lives were affected in those few minutes. And uh, at the same time, how life moves on, right? But people all need help. And that's what we're doing right now. And uh, when the pandemic started, whether it's IIS or whichever organization, we said, okay, fine, let's you know, roll out. Let's start doing something. We can't just sit. And so unlike maybe 30, 40 years ago, where you, know, you had no clue what to do when there's something that happens around you or you hear about it, today we can raise our hands and start off. Yes, that's one amazing thing Master Cho has given. And I'm very happy about that because it makes me feel I was able to contribute even in the the, the tiniest uh, portion to bringing about some kind of healing. Yeah. Uh, so um, coming back to what we were talking about. Yes. Uh, hold on. There are questions suddenly. Uh, we are in comfort zone and forgot the purpose. Uh, is it alert or wake up for us through the coronavirus? Yes, even if you're in a non-contained zone and you are in a city or a state where it's not so badly affected, but if it is something that's affecting the whole globe, you really need to also look and see how you can help. Uh, if you're, ha you're okay, then you need to remember, hey, you know what? That person is also my brother and sister because we're all ch a, a child of God. And so how do I help that person? And so that's why we're doing the meditations uh, every day. We're doing the great invocation every day. And that really makes a change. So the point is when this energy is manifesting, there's obviously some negative karma manifesting globally. And so you want to then pull in more positive vibrations all through the globe. And so if more and more and more of us start to do the meditation on Twin Hearts, it would make a big difference. And so, uh, for example, here in Bangalore, 
we started to do the Twin Hearts every three hours. So we start at nine o'clock and we used to end at 11 uh, p.m., leaving uh, close to about uh, six odd hours where there's no meditation being done. And the Great Invocation was done every hour, right? So even now, it's, it starts at 6 a.m., and it continues all the way till uh, 11 p.m. ending almost, uh, sorry, at midnight. It, the last person who does it is at midnight. So they have their own group and they do it. The point is to have regular flow of divine energy in, into your city, into your, uh, into your country. So the energies that are already manifesting will hopefully part of it get neutralized. And then what has to happen will still happen. But at least you've contributed towards making things better. Yes, whether you can heal a person without his knowledge uh, the person we don't know. Now, if it's someone who's really suffering, uh, like I'm, I'm, I think that must be with the CPH session, I'm not sure. But if there's someone who's really suffering and a family member calls and says, listen, I need you to do healing. Can you please heal this person? And if it's really important, my personal thing is I would help them. Yes. Now, most people who know me are either my patients or my friends or my family. And so their relative or their uh, person is someone I usually know. And so I have a connection with them. So I, I would probably do the healing. Uh, so far, luckily, only the persons who I had to heal for this particular case are relatives and, and they are all fine today. They, they were considered positive uh, medically and now they're negative. And so using the teachings, you can. Yeah. So um, that's that's basically something that you could do. Yes. You're most welcome, people from Nepal. I, I'm really sorry the money stuck with us, though. <laughs> but thank you to everyone out there. Uh, with so much meditation, uh, is, is that we not get congested? Of course, and we will get congested. And if you have been doing that, you know, the Vesak week where we did seven days, you had to do more exercise, you know, just uh, getting up and uh, just jumping around is not enough. We actually had to do more exercise, maybe half an hour or... Uh, 20 minutes of vigorous uh, exercise where you actually sweat, very important. Because otherwise, you know, you see what happens is uh, we're doing meditation, we're trying to help the whole world. But as the meditation energy comes in, it's like fertilizer for all that is within you. So the goodness in you that is loving and, you know, being compassionate and understanding also gets energy. But sadly, also the weaknesses in you get energy. So I'm not too sure if you've noticed, if you've been meditating every day, your weaknesses have been coming out very quickly every day. So whether you are irritable, whether you're a person who's angry, uh, whether you're a person who's, uh, who's, who's someone who is envious or you, know, you feel that you're not good enough, <laughs> all these qualities have been just coming out because we haven't do, been doing enough purification. And so whether it's pranic psychotherapy, whether it's uh, any of the techniques of our Hatha Yoga that you know of, please do it. And please exercise. And if possible, do your breathing as well. Yeah. So that's, that's basically something that you need to do. Uh, we're staying in Thailand uh, from last 14 years. Everything is going fine. Is this though my husband went to India for my mother-in-law's surgery and stuck in India? Is this also? Yes, obviously it would be karma because you're back in Thailand. You're okay. Your country is safe. However, he's in a country, I'm not sure which city he is in, uh, where things might not be as safe. Uh, luckily, compared to the rest of the world, um, India seems to be in a better position. However, uh, taking care of yourself and, of course, being there uh, for his mother, uh, who, who also needs him, is equally important. So loving kindness to his mother and also loving kindness to self by taking care of himself would be important. Uh, so the karma is also one connected to his mother right? Our mothers are very important to us. Our fathers are very important to us, without whom we wouldn't be here physically. So we have some debts to pay to them as well. So yes, definitely karma. All right. So let's go on. He is in Indore, hopefully not so badly affected as Maharashtra. So I'm hoping it'll be okay for him. Okay. So let's move on. So we're talking about just the first one. The next one is basically you want to have the ability to do good to triumph any evil that is around us. Yes, there is a lot of uh, things that are happening around us that's not really very helpful uh, most of the time. But one of the things that we need to remember is that when 
we start to do more good. We use our will, our love, our intelligence to do good. Automatically, it will win over evil or the tendency in you and I to do something that is not good. Yes. So one of the things that you need to consider is that we ourselves have our own sorrows. We ourselves have our own karmas that will manifest causing whatever, you know, pain, hurt, uh, lack of funds, um, poor health, all these things will happen. And at the same time, it will happen to those around us in the world. Yes. And uh, if we start to understand that there is, yes, sorrow and troubles as well as to the world, but the result is that when you start to understand these teachings and you understand what is happening and why it's happening, you are more at peace because you realize, hey, you know what? This is how it's supposed to be. And so you don't get troubled. You don't get worried, but you have a greater sense of serenity in you. And they say, ultimately, you will be able to be cheerful and joyful, even though life around you doesn't seem so great. So there are times when, you know, um, you tend to go and meet people who are not as well off as you or studied as much as you, but you realize their life is so much more happier than you. And then you wonder, how come I'm not? Right. And so even though they, they don't look like they have everything, they're happier than you and me. They're more cheerful. They're more um, joyous, uh, both inside and externally. And we need to try and figure out why. One of the causes is there is uh, a lot of worry. Yes. Oh my God. Will we have enough money? Will this be okay? Will that be okay? And that worry is, is a big issue for most of us. Yes. But if we can be optimistic and we start to realize, Hey, you know what? There is still good in the world. There's still good in other people and not be a pessimist would make a big difference to our lives. And to remember that all evil that surrounds us is only temporary. It cannot, it cannot prevail forever. Yes. So whatever is good in any person or in anything around us, yes, must necessarily be persistent and useful because it has behind it the omnipotence of the current of God, which is the power of God. So the good will always continue to go forward because that is the energy of God, which is coming through. Yeah. Then uh, moving further, so let me just add a few more things here that I'd like to talk before I go to the next one. So to understand, to be fully assured that in the final, yes, good will triumph over everything else, the, uh, the remains of any and all forms of evil. And so it says, he knows that it is his duty to combat these to the utmost with his own power. So we have to use our own internal power, our own willpower to overcome our own limitations and weaknesses. We don't have to go out there and try and conquer the world, but let's conquer our own weaknesses first. Yes. And in doing so, he is working upon the side of greater evolution. So, so we, when we start to become better and better, we are actually siding the, 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 the uh, evolution of God that is for us. Yes and bringing nearer the time of its ultimate victory. So um, none will be more active than he in laboring for the good. So all of us who fight for the good, all of us who fight over our own personal limitations to try and do what is right, to try and do what is good, are already going closer and closer to where we are supposed to be. Yes, both with reference to victory over uh, the evil or negative qualities or limitations within us and also towards evolution, right? And so the next one that we have here is with reference to fear, another problem that a lot of people have. So just to remember, we've spoken about this earlier. So the absence of fear is very important in our lives. Now, what are the fears? Um, many people are, yes, one is unrest because of the condition, even at this point with COVID-19. People are wondering what will happen to, uh, you know, our currency, what will happen with the political scenario, with the economical scenario, uh, with the big companies, uh, what, what, how are they going to take it forward and what's going to happen to smaller companies, right? So, so there's a lot of unrest globally. There are big, big uh, corporations, organizations that are already bankrupt. They, they're going through financial crisis. There are smaller ones that have already shut down completely. They don't plan to open up because they cannot handle what's going on. 
And so uh, what the biggest uh, hit is for the travel and tourism industry. Yes. And so we need to bless them so they can recoup, revive and steadily start to progress. Very important for them. But if you realize all this is part of the scheme, yes, uh, and fear that, yes, this might go down, but then there's something else that will come. So with everything, there is a slump, but there is also the upward curve to remember that. That is when we, we recognize that life is uh, up and down, but we're also optimistic. Yes. And one of the fears is the fear of death. And this is something that most people have. They, want, they worry, oh my God, you know, my life, I need to live this. And so there are many people who live this life as only the only life. And, and so they get so stuck to materialistic things. Uh, they get stuck with the needs of the body. And that, when you look at it from the higher perspective, you realize, hey, you know what? You're just wasting time. You're like a kid who's stuck with, you know, their toys and their, their gadgets. And they're so excited about it. But we all outgrow our toys. We all outgrow our uh, desire for all these things, yes? So if you remember your childhood days, didn't you want to have this and that? And what the neighbor had or that girl's uh, toy or this guy's uh, vehicle or gun, you wanted one as well. And so you have to remember that even with evolution, even with our human race, there are still people here on earth who are still like that, who still want power, they want prestige, they want name, they want fame. And that's all they live for. And so they are very, very young souls in a way. Yes, they're like little kids who are so excited about it. But you've got to remember, Master Chua says, you don't have to tell the child, stop using that toy. Don't use that teddy bear. He says they will naturally give it away. Yes, they will naturally stop using those things. They will learn to understand and accept different things. And so, so it is also with the human race. Yes, so with our so-called younger brothers and sisters, give them time. They will let go of all these needs that they have. Right. But if you and I start to understand the teachings of theosophy, you already realize there is no use of trying to harp on it and try to get more and more of it. Yes. As long as you do justice so that everyone gets what they require, that's good enough. And so one of the fears is with reference to death. Yes. Uh, people are worried what's going to happen after death. You know, what will happen to what I have? What will happen to uh, all the possessions, all the money, all the wealth? So that is a big fear but for you and me this is not a fear because for us we realize hey you know what death is nothing it's just me removing one coat and moving to another one and then of course there's a there's a whole concept about not understanding what reincarnation is about so the truth of reincarnation which we had in the last few sessions helps us understand that hey you know what i'm going to be coming back i the incarnate soul will go back to my high soul and i will come back I will live forever and ever and ever. I'm not going to die. It's only my body or bodies that will be, will die or will be left behind and I will progress. My only point is every time I come here, I want to become better and better and better and progress towards becoming a better person along with evolution. Yes. And so reincarnation for us is just the best thing that we can ever understand. And one is to realize, yes, the life that we have today is only one day of this whole life of my higher soul. Yes, it's not the entire thing. So, um, so to move on, he will have no fear of death, although he realizes that he must live his life to the appointed end because he is here for the purpose of progress. We're here only to progress. Every situation around us is geared to help us progress. Yes, and in the process, we have to overcome uh, a lot of our, uh, if we can call the word karmas here. Yes, both good and uh, bad karmas. We have to pay off our debts because without paying it, it's not possible for us to move forward. Yes, so um, we are also free from what is called religion. Yes, so if the religion dictates... Uh, for example, this is what's going to happen and you're going to be suffering or that, uh, for example, the Christian tradition, you're going to go to hell or in the Islamic uh, tradition, it says something else. So we realize that there is something beyond what religion has mentioned. Yes. And so it says here, free from any religious fears or worries or troubles. Yes. We realize clearly that progress is towards the highest of the divine will. That is for all of us. Yes. And we ourselves... Uh, only people who we are the only persons who can delay that 
destination for ourselves. We are the only ones who can stop ourselves from going towards the end of this journey. No one else can stop us. So whatever we have created in the past, those are the only things that, those are the only things that can actually cause a problem for us this lifetime. No one else can. Yes. So to remember that. And so um, he is satisfied quietly to do his work and to try to help his fellow in this race forward. Yes. Knowing that the great divine power is behind him, pressing him onward and forward. So in the end, we realize this great divine power is behind us. It's always going to be with us. And the pressure through which that great power will help us go forward is all we not need to realize. Align ourselves, overcome our limitations, weaknesses, work through our karmas, and that's it. Life can become, um, no, I'm not saying that it become much easier, but the ability to deal with it, just like we deal with things in, in, in the physical world, right? We know that, uh, for example, in India right now, or in, in the city I come from, we have a curfew. Uh, so you can be out from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So I wouldn't want to go out after 7 p.m. Yes, because I know that's, that's what they've asked us to do. I know at the same time, right now, it is very important for me to uh, sanitize my hands, wash my hands on a regular basis, not to touch my face. And so I will abide with that because I do not at any point uh, want to have a problem with this body. And so I will abide by the rules and, and the, the uh, protocols given. So if the same way that we do in our physical life, with our incarnated life, yes, as the life of the higher soul, if we can start to then recognize these are the laws by which this, this life actually works, yes, we might actually have a better life. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're very used to doing everything by the law in the physical world, yes, which is just one day. But have we started to look at the regulations and the rules and the laws with reference to the higher soul's evolution? If we then understand the teachings of theosophy, you'll make that growth of yours much easier by abiding by the rules of the teacher. And in this case, the rules of um, the universe or the solar system at this point. Yeah. And so uh, moving forward, since he knows all this, right? Uh, we are all part of one great evolution. So we realize we are all part of one great evolution and, uh, and are all literally children of the same father, that is the supreme being. And he sees that he sees the universal brotherhood in humanity. So we're all one. And so for us, when we bless the earth, we're not blessing only people from my country or, or the race I, I belong to, but it's the whole of humanity because every person there is my brother and sister. Yes. And, uh, to also understand that what we're talking about is not some, some fairy tale, but it's some, it's a condition that exists here right now. Yes, even with the present a pandemic that we're all going through, it is something that is still going on. No man can ever make real gain. Yes, no man, going to the next point, no man can ever make real gain for himself at the cost of loss or suffering to someone else. Yes, so people think that they can get away with the harm that they do uh, to people in their office, uh, to people in their community, uh, to people from another community because you're not from the same community or the same religion. There's harm done because one wants to acquire more land across the borders, uh, across countries. There's enmity because one wants to be more powerful than the other. And in, in the process, they do harm uh, people from another place. When you do this, you have to realize you're going against the law of evolution. So you can never gain, you can never be popular, um, even if you are on the physical level up there, it's never going to help you go forward. So if you do anything to harm another person, harm a group of people, harm a whole city, a country, you will have to pay for it. Yes. And so to move on, humanity is literally a whole. Nothing which injures one man can ever be really for... Uh, it will not be good for another. Yes. So harming anybody on whatever level is not going to be good for any of us. It will come back to us. And so he knows that the only true advantage for him is that benefit, which, which can be something that can be shared by all. So when you do something that is good, yes, when you gain something, 
it should be gain for everyone. And so Master Cho says, when you look at even um, spiritual business management, he says, you have to look at a situation that is a win-win for all. You can't win and the other pers person can't lose. If that's the way you're going, then your target is completely off. So he says, even when you're working, uh, any situation that you have, it has to be a win-win for both parties. Always a win-win for both parties. Yeah. So, so the other thing is to realize that there will be, as the great Lord Buddha said, there is suffering in life. And so when we recognize and understand, yes, there is going to be sorrow. There is going to be suffering in life. But that is also the cause of it is basically me to a large extent. And so one who bears suffering and sorrow nobly in his struggle towards the light is lifting a little of the heavy load of the sorrow and sufferings of his brothers as well. Yes. So every time a person recognizes, you know what, what I'm going through is because of me and what I've done in my past. As soon as I recognize that and I continue with my life, learning my lessons and moving on, you change the burden for other human beings. Though, yes, we all have our own individual higher soul, you will change the consciousness of humanity. And so hopefully, if we all do this on a regular basis, then the, the future races will be able to do this faster than you and me. You know, it's, it's like this when, when you have a, a family and uh, people want to do something different. Yes, uh, especially, uh, I think for us in India, about uh, 20 odd years, it would be very rare to find uh, a girl from a particular community marrying a boy from a different community or one religion to another. And the first, you know, uh, youngster in the family who does it has the toughest, you know, wall to fight with the whole family, the whole generation, all the emotional blackmail uh, to break that and go forward. But all the others after her or him who then want to do the same thing finds it easy. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the initial person who has to kind of break that, that rhythm that is there in the, in, in the family will find it very, very tough. But all people who come after that will find doing that very easy. By then family are like, it's okay, it doesn't matter. I have four or five of them have gotten married from outside now. Let this one also go, no problem. So the same thing with us, if we start breaking the pattern, yes, where we realize, hey, there is suffering, there is sorrow, but to realize that this is all my own, yes, my own making, and that if I work through it and recognize that this is part of me and move forward, then the race that comes after us, the generations that come after us will be able to do this faster than you and me. Yes. But remember, you have made it easier for them. So maybe some good karma there. <laughs> All right. So let me just read this out uh, really quickly. Um, so we were just talking about reducing the weight for the others. So his attitude towards all those around him, yes, changes radically. So when he starts to change, the way he starts to look at life, it starts to influence people around him and they will also slowly start to change. Yes. And there is a radical change in the end uh, all over. And sometimes this change, if it was left to, uh, for, for society to do it on its own, might take a very, very long time. But because of your influence and the kind of work you did, then suddenly this change is much faster than otherwise. Yeah. It naturally follows that he becomes filled with the widest possible tolerance and charity. And so when, when the person starts uh, to understand, yes, there is sorrow and there's suffering, he will also be tolerant of others because he has already gone through his own suffering. He understands what it is. And so when someone else goes through a difficult time, he is there to help them. And also he learns how to be charitable, how to share, how to give to others, not only hold and keep for himself because he realizes in giving, the law changes as well uh, towards his, his betterment as well. So it naturally follows that he becomes filled with the widest possible tolerance and charity. He cannot but be always tolerant, but because of this philosophy that he understands, enables him to have to give allowance to others. Yes, to give leeway to others to say, okay, fine, you made the first mistake, it's okay. Second mistake, okay. Third mistake, sorry, pal, bye. <laughs> yes, so you become more tolerant and understanding of people. Right, and so um, going forward, he goes further than tolerance and charity. He starts to then become more sympathetic, yes? So sympathy is one of those uh, virtues that he starts to develop. He feels 
positive love towards mankind, not just uh, people around him. And that leads him to adopt a position of watchful helpfulness. So he looks to see who needs help and then goes out there. And so his charity starts to go beyond. Yes. It also enables him to give advice or help in almost any case which comes before him. You see, when you have struggled through life, then it is easy for you to give advice to others. But if you haven't struggled through life, it's not easy for you to tell another person what to do. You know, um, many years ago, when, when I did something called counseling psychology, as a student, uh, very, very young, I'm still very young, but in those days, uh, it was a little difficult to tell people that, you know, I would have men and women who would come with, you know, broken marriages to me. And I had no idea. I mean, the only people I've seen was married is my mother and father or my friends, parents or my uncle and aunt. And I have no idea what it did, what it meant to be, you know, a husband or a wife in a relationship. And uh, I would find it a little, little uh, overwhelming to figure out, okay, how do I deal with these people? How do I help them? And of course, luckily, uh, we have seniors who we go and discuss the cases and try, they try to guide us. But my point was, there were situations that I had never experienced. Not that I'm going to experience everything in life, but um, that kind of helped me deal with, uh, with them because of the advice of others. Right. Uh, and another situation is when they came to me with issues uh, about their children. Now, as a child, if the child came and said, I have this issue, it's easy for me because I was there just uh, a few years ago. And so I know what it was to be a child and, and have parents say this or elders say this or teachers say this. So it is easier for me to give advice. But when it came to areas that I had not experienced, it's very, very difficult. Now, if you've never had a child, it's very difficult for you to tell someone else how to take care of a child. Right. And so people are going to look at you and say, hey, you know, have you ever had a child to tell me what to do? You can write a book about it. Great. But without your experience, it's very difficult uh, to try and give advice to someone else. And so the point here is, if you have struggled through your life, I'm talking about your spiritual life in, in your journey as, as a soul. If you have done and gone through this and come out of it, then it is very easy for you to then help people who come to you. Now, in my life, personally, I find that people who come to me with a lot of their questions, I'm able to answer it. I, you know, somehow I'm able to see it or whatever and, and, and guide them if, if that's, uh, that's something I'm supposed to do. Sometimes I'm not allowed to give the advice. But when it comes to my own life, I realize it's very tough. It's like I almost can't see what should be the solution for this situation because I'm in it. I'm involved in it. I'm emotional about it. I'm, 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 I have thoughts about it already. And so those color the way I can use then my discernment or my intelligence. And so then I have to pull myself out of my situation and look at it from above to realize, okay, what should I be doing? Yes. And so that takes a lot more effort for me. Whereas uh, when someone else comes, it, it's like this, it, it just comes really quickly, uh, how to help them and what to do and what to say. Yeah. So um, let me just move on with this. Yep. And so um, he has no sort of wish to convert anyone um, because of his own thinking. So just because I think this way and I feel life, this is right, you know, there is a law of evolution. There's a law, law of cause and effect, which we spoke about a couple of sessions ago. And if I can abide by these two, my life should be easier. But I'm not going to go out there and start telling my friends and my relatives and my siblings about it and say, you know, you guys forget everything else. Forget your religion, your spirituality, just follow this. No, it doesn't work like that. And I am not here to convince the rest of the world. I'm here to learn for myself, apply it in my life. And then maybe when I apply it in my life, others who see it will say, you know what? I think I like what she's doing. I think I want to see how my life can become better if he or she is doing it. And so you have to become, remember when we spoke about earlier, you have to perfect it before you start to, to kind of ask other people to change. And so unless you reform yourself, you can't reform the world. I remember those were the words in the book. All right, so let's move on. Uh, one last bit and then I'll stop, yeah? See, I thought I'll finish it, but it's not possible. It's, it's not a very long chapter, but I just thought it, would not, it wouldn't happen today. Maybe it's my thought form as well. Never know. So in every relation of life, this idea of helpfulness comes into play, not only with regard to his fellow men, but also with the other kingdoms. 
Yes. And so once you start becoming this person, trying to understand how things are working and uh, the way you think, the way you, the way you talk, the way you do things will not just encompass the human, the human race, uh, as they say here, your helpfulness. Yes. Your love, your manifestation of love in action, that is service will go beyond fellow men. It will also move towards the animal kingdom, how you treat the animals, how uh, you coexist with the animals, which we spoke about also earlier. Yes. And so it would hopefully in future bring about a close relationship between man and his younger brother, which is the animal kingdom. Yes. And so recognizes this kingdom that also needs help at some point. And uh, in relation to them shall be always for their good and never for their harm. So whatever we do for the animal kingdom is going to be for them, good for them. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why um, in due course, a lot of them stop eating uh, their younger brothers. Yes. They, they prefer not to because of this understanding. And so, and so ultimately a person who understands theosophy regulates, it says here, he uh, regulates his life according to the law of evolution. And I would also say the law of cause and effect, which we spoke about. Yes. And uh, to just conclude. So what happens is, <clears throat> and because of this, yes, he has a completely different standpoint and a touchstone by which to try everything. His thoughts, his feelings, and his own actions are all according to this. So he starts to change the way he thinks, the way he talks, or the words that come out of his mouth and his action. And that's basically inner reflection, firm resolution. So if you can then, you've been hearing it many times in this talk, uh, repeating myself over and over again. <laughs> but I think this is basically Master Chor reminding us over and over again. Have you done your inner reflection, firm resolution? Yes. Or did you do it only for that one week of Vesak with the group? So to remind us over and over again, can you please start going back to your teachings, which you have paid so much to learn and understand and the good, good karma to hear it. Yes. That would be very, very important. All right. So with that, I think I will just end here. Yes. Uh, we still have quite a bit. Okay. So Monday is when I will have to meet you for this. So let me just go to some questions so we don't delay too long for you. Being a Saturday, I don't want you to be away from your family for too long, is including my family. <laughs> is there any possibility uh, in coming years that beings, aliens with UFOs, <laughs> all right, Rahul, uh, from other universes might visit Earth and guide us? Uh, so, you know, for these great beings to travel, they probably don't need a vehicle like a UFO. Uh, many of them may not even be in their physical form. So for, for example, when we spoke about uh, yesterday about Venus, uh, the Lord of the flame and the children of the uh, fire mist, they, when they come, they don't come in a UFO, but these beings do travel to assist uh, the human race to help us overcome uh, or become better or help us with our evolution or evolutionary process. They do come. And we spoke about that yesterday. Yeah. To guide us. It, it, will they come in the future? Well, if we work towards uh, improving ourselves uh, rapidly and properly, then the high beings may not need assistance from outside, right? So we will not need to call uh, them. The ones who are here will be good enough to help us go forward. But if it isn't, then if it is better, yes. However, don't, don't forget that for every uh, root race, yes, uh, there will be a teacher that will come and sometimes even more than one teacher, we were talking about uh, spiritual guides and spiritual teachers who will then descend to help man evolve. And so in due time, uh, the, the most recent of all religions that came was the religion of Islam. And uh, one of the great teachings of Islam is to realize and recognize that we need to worship only God, right? And so there is no other but God. So our ultimate connection is to the Supreme Being. So that's, that's uh, one of the most important teachings that they came down with. Now, the next religion that will come in due course will have something else that is required for the human race to understand. So the religion will be based on the needs of the human, um, human race at that point. And so it will change. And 
that is another way in which we will be assisted. Yeah. So to improve our knowledge, uh, to improve everything, th this will take place. Now, yes, with reference to science and technology and all the other departments that are there, there will be beings that will be sent to help assist if that is the need of the day at this point. It's seen hurt and aliens from other universes already present in every part of the earth uh, who are even in many powerful positions. Uh, yes, now with reference to the aliens, we don't call them aliens. We call them, uh, like I said, the Lord of the Flames who are from Venus. Um, the beings of in Venus are more than one full chain period and a half ahead of us. They're very, very evolved. So they're they're giving us time to even help our human race uh, help our chain itself is is a great privilege for us and so yes they do uh, have certain posts in the great white brotherhood that they host uh, hold even today actually high positions of uh, that particular group and when and we, when our own human brothers and sisters are able to align themselves or evolve to that point they will take the position of these uh, existing posts by them and the Lord of the Flames will leave, yes, because they've done their bit. Okay, so what if uh, soldiers guard, guarding in India-Pakistan border or any border, soldiers die for their country? Does that affect them karmically? <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the things that Master Cho mentioned is that when you are out there trying to protect your country and her people, and if in, in the line of duty you have to shoot at the enemy and you do it purely out of duty, no karma involved. But if you shoot and you get emotional about it, yes, either you enjoy doing something like that uh, when, when, you, when you kill people and you get pleasure out of it, or you do it out of some emotional uh, issue, um, you know, all the drama and the Hindi uh, movies, then when that happens, when it becomes emotional, it becomes personal. When it gets personal, it becomes karmic. Yes, so you're indebted to that person. Otherwise, if it's pure duty, no problem. That's the duty of a soldier. You do your duty. No issues. What is our final goal? Um, the first slide. Can you please repeat it? First. What is our final goal? Uh, the final goal is what God has in store for us. And it is supposed to be all of us going back to him. But in going back to him, not only will God by as a great being evolved, but we have also evolved. And therefore the ability for this great being to then bestow his love upon us and for us to then reciprocate is something that can happen only when we all evolve to become gods ourselves. Yes. Now remember, we're all fragments of that great being. And so when we evolve, we are all going to go back, uniting, uniting and going back to God. And so that's the journey. And that's the goal for all of us here. Yeah. How much karma we are entitled if we go against the government rules in a nation? Okay, uh, Balachandra, I hope you're not doing too many things that are going against the government. Now, it really depends on what the government is doing and what you plan to do against the government. Now, if, this is, uh, if the government has actually been torturing and causing harm to her people and you have decided to do something to help the people, that action that you do for the common good of all and only with the in intention of helping others would be okay, right? Because you're trying to help. Remember your helpfulness goes beyond your home, your family, but to a larger community. And in this case, probably your whole country against the government. Yeah. I mean, going against uh, rational life. Okay. I didn't understand that. As you said, uh, going against um, the marriage system, rational is that we are entitled to karma or only the punishment of government law only. So if you go against marriage, um, I'm not sure what you mean, uh, but say, <laughs> what would you do in marriage that would go against the government? I really don't know. Okay, let me just read the last part. I mean, if I do something or try some irrational way by going against the rules and regulations uh, to benefit the society. Yes, so, so you might have to find ways in which you can do things to help um, you know, the, the larger group in your city, for example, or your country. 
uh, which might go against sometimes the rules uh, of the government. So Master Chua says, when you want to do such things, you have to be smart about it. So you have to figure out a way in which you get to do um, good that helps everyone. But at the same time, it is somewhere in line with the government. So they can't come and really uh, get you for what you did, especially the good that you did. Yes. Now, with reference to marriage, I'm sorry, I still didn't get that. Uh, however, uh, say, for example, the, the law says that uh, you are allowed to, say, marry uh, two women. Yes. So say, for example, you're in Africa and you're allowed to marry two women and it's OK. Now, the point is, can you actually then love both the women equally and give equal to both? Because you can't love you know, more, one more than the other, which, which naturally happens. So I think it's a difficult situation. So I'm, I'm not too sure. So the government might say, you know, you're allowed, no problem. But within that relationship between the three of you, are you able to handle it is, is something that you need to look into. That's, that's as far as I can say. Uh, if Kali Yuga is ending, uh, who were the great avatars of that time? Uh, so you'll have to go back into Master Chua's Existence of God. The last few chapters has some of that information. <laughs> and if you have Master Chua's uh, book called um, Hinduism Revealed, there is also the yugas there. So maybe that can also help you understand a few of these things. There have been a lot of avatars who've come uh, recently. So if you look at the great uh, teachings of the, the recent religions, whether it is when Christianity or, or uh, Islam, they're all the recent ones. But there have been some even before that, yes? So how long was Kali Yuga? So you need to take that whole time period, whether it was 2,400 years or whatever, and find out who are the teachers who came at that point. That's as simple as it can get. I haven't done it, so I can't really give you that answer right now. But it is there in those two books if you look into it. Uh, why, is, why is it effect of our good and bad actions experience in other lifetimes instead of the same lifetime because uh, just like when we put a seed into the ground this is master Chua's teachings and i think the teachings of all the uh, great sacred books when you put rice into the ground it takes between five to six months for it to harvest yes but when you put a mango seed into the ground it might take five years to actually bear fruit and so Certain actions of yours might come back to you in six months, some of it in five years, some of it in five incarnations. So the, the maturity of those actions will take time, right? Uh, it's like an echo that you have. Depending on the kind of place that you are, the echo will come as quickly as possible. Sometimes it will kind of resonate, right? So the, the point is... Uh, when you kick, for example, a ball and, and the room is very small, when you kick the ball, the ball will come back to you really quickly. But if it's a huge field, when you kick the ball, if it hits the wall on the other side and comes back, it's going to take time. So something like that is what we're referring to when we talk about karma, yeah? I don't think there are UFOs, so I'm not explaining that. Okay, uh, thank you, Radhika. Okay, you mean <laughs> what type of Thai thing we should do to improve relationship between couples? Um, relationship between couples, what's missing in their life is usually happiness and forgiveness. So, one is to help them try and do forgiveness uh, for each other, another is maybe to give Thai thing to an orphanage. So, when you bring happiness to those children, hopefully, there'll be happiness in their lives as well. Yeah, so that could be one or two things. People, there are no aliens. Yeah, we're not talking about aliens in that sense. <clears throat> not in the sense that the US makes all these movies and stuff. They don't come and take you and do stuff to you and blah, blah, blah. You know, Master Chua says, uh, when, you, when you want to blame people, you want to blame someone else for what's happening in your life and, uh, you know, your neighbor and your cousin and your parents, you know, you want to blame everyone. And then when you can't blame anyone else, then it's the aliens. <laughs> So Master Cho says, you just find excuses to blame other people. And if it's aliens that helps you, then go ahead. <laughs> so anyway, that was something he said a long time ago. Uh, do eating non-veg reduce the pace of our spiritual development? Um, rosemary, not really. 
Master Cho has never told us that we need to stop with eating non-veg. You've got to remember that uh, the communities that actually eat non-veg come from a place where vegetables don't grow very well. Yes. Uh, so if you look at the Islamic tradition or you look at part of even the Christian tradition, they come from the Middle East and most of it is dry land. They don't have, you know, tomatoes just blooming there and not all parts. Yeah, there are certain parts that are very, very prosperous and flourishing with amazing stuff like around the oasis and stuff. But major cities, it's basically dry, it's barren. And so they need to survive. And to survive, what do you have around? They're only animals. And so they do live on, on animal and uh, in the nights it gets very cold. And so to work with that, the meat actually builds heat within the body. And so we have to understand uh, that you have to give them time. And then in due course, hopefully, they realize, you know, you don't want to eat animals anymore. And so they will choose to stop. Right. It's not for us uh, to say that this is better or that is not. And all their holy books, whether it's the Quran or whether it's the Bible, it is mentioned already there, what they can and cannot eat. And interestingly, it's the same that Master Cho has mentioned in um, either Arhatic Yoga or um, the Achieving Oneness with the Higher Soul course. Yeah. So if you're eating, please, you don't have to stop at all. Yeah. When your body refuses it, then you may stop. You don't have to stop at all. Okay. Um, are the Lord of the Flames the seven Kumaras? Uh, I'm not too sure, Shanti, about the seven Kumaras. I remember that name, but I can't remember the connection if there was any. Yeah. Anyone can see etheric form of Lord of Flames from Venus? You know, um, Shijit, they may not even have etheric bodies. <laughs> Um, we have physical bodies because we are still on the physical plane. Remember, there are beings on other planets and they don't have what is called physical form. Maybe in Mars and Mercury, they have etheric form, but not Venus. So they may not even have an etheric body. So are, are you already trained your eyes to see astral and mental bodies? Then maybe if they're around and if you are, have the luxury of seeing them, uh, the Great White Brotherhood doesn't usually come and meet the common uh, man or even the... Uh, spiritual aspirants at this point. Yeah, that's as far as I know. Okay, can you please elaborate uh, Lord of the Flames holding offices? Uh, Vani, this is what we spoke about yesterday, uh, that the Lord of the Flames are there and they're here and they continue to help us. Some of them have gone, uh, but many of them still hold um, offices in the Great White Brotherhood. And the Great White Brotherhood is, is a great team that takes care of with reference to our evolution, many, many aspects. Yes. And so that is not going to be part of what we're going to talk about today, but yes. And, and so there are many of them who ho hold posts there and each of them have different duties that they have to take care of. So I remember Master Cho said once that uh, there are these great beings, one being just creating energy that is required for the survival of, of the planet. Um, for example, one of the great beings is uh, Buddha Kuan Yin, who, who's the, who's a great deity of mercy and compassion, but also listens to all our prayers and answers the prayers. And that's an amazing responsibility, right? Try answering all your emails in one day. <laughs> it doesn't work. And she takes care of, <laughs> I don't know how many billions, millions uh, of prayers and goal. Maybe some of us send more than one a day. So that, that's a lot. Uh, and so th there are these great beings that they take uh, position of those offices and those duties. But as soon as a human, uh, person evolves to that point and can then take on one of those posts, then they will let go of that post, give it to the, to the human race and move forward. Yeah. Okay, people. So that's about it. Uh, underage marriages. Well, uh, personally for me, underage marriages are, uh, it's my opinion that I feel a lot of the young girls and young boys are not yet in an emotional and mental state to be able to take on a responsibility of running a family, yes? However, keeping that in mind, our grandparents have done that, yes? My, I think my grandmother got married at 14 or 15. She had my mother when she was 16. I was like, my God, I can't think of having a child at 16. But she did, and uh, she was a grandmother at my age, right? And so when I look back, I'm like, I'm not ready to be a grandmother. But then when I look around, I, I see people um, who are already becoming great grandmothers and grandmothers really quickly. But somehow 
those souls were guided to do what was required to take care of their children. Whether they had four children, my other grandmother had 11 children. So whatever they had to do, they were able to do, even though they were really, really young and took care of quite large families. I mean, today, if you talk about a family with four, it's very rare. <laughs> yes. Uh, one or two is, is the most common. One is the common, the most common, right? Actually. Right. So um, underage for me, um, I just feel these souls need a little bit more time uh, to be able to handle uh, responsibilities. I, I have friends who've gotten married. Uh, uh, my friends were Muslims. And so they got married at, I think, I think bef way before she was 18. And one just after she turned, I think, 19. That was really young. And so their, their kids are really big, right? They're, they're young men now. And for me, uh, I don't think I would be happy starting off that young. But they've done a good job with their kids. So I'm not going to say that they did badly with their kids at any point. But I just feel uh, preparing them a little bit more makes it easier for them to handle another soul. Because you've got to remember when a soul is given to you and me to take care of, it is not our child. It's not my son or my daughter. Master Chur says, this soul is entrusted in you for you to mold them, teach them, so they can then deal with life when they go out. That's all you're there. You're a teacher. You're a guide. You're supposed to help them. Help them realize what is my destiny going to be. Give them whatever you can in teachings in, to help them build better qualities, character, so that when they go out there, they can be the best person they can. That's it. They're not ours to keep. They're not ours to decide what they need to do. They choose to do what they have. They come with their own destiny. Yep. So that's, that's Master Chua and that's what I believe in. Yeah. So that's underage marriage. Eloping with a minor girl. <laughs> Where is all this coming from? Okay. Uh, eloping with a minor girl. Well, you know, the choice of falling in love and um, thinking that this is the ultimate is something that we can't help. And uh, when you're in love, they say you, you're blinded by love. And yes, sometimes you think you can conquer the whole world with it. Some do, some don't. And so when they decide to do this, they're going to be on their own. So hoping and blessing that <clears throat> uh, this young man and this minor girl are, are going to be blessed and guided to have proper light, light, love and power in their lives to take it forward. That's all we can say. Yeah. Okay. So marriage against the law. I don't know what marriage against the law is. What does the law say? You mean like, uh, I don't know what that is. Okay. I don't know what that is. Are the entire pranic healing family, especially your Hatha Yogi graduates, going to evolve? Um, I think you're trying to say same time and will they all go to the next chain? <laughs> no. A lot of people who do Arhatic Yoga are not necessarily practicing. <laughs> so I think if you ask all the people here who are, I, I can see a lot of Arhatic Yogis here. <laughs> if you ask them to raise their hands and say, are you practicing diligently, properly? Can you vow to that? I think most of them will put their hands down. <laughs> we are working towards it. Yeah, we're working towards it. Uh, but yes, even in the Arhatic Yoga school, doesn't mean that all of us are on the same level. Yes, so even a prep graduate could be much higher than uh, a so-called graduate who thinks they've done level three or level four. You will understand by the way they behave. You will understand by the way they deal with situations, which level they are. Yes, are they more evolved or not so evolved? When you notice the things that they do are more for themselves, then you have to wonder, what is this person really up to? Are they really using the teachings um, to help others or are they doing it for their own personal gain? Now, I'm, I'm not referring to people who are trying to take money. Sometimes for them, they need that money to survive. And so they're trying to do whatever they can to survive. But there are others who try to use certain things to get gains. And so you need to be aware of that. Yes. So not everything that's out there is free. All teachings that you get, you have to do something with it, about it. Yes, for the common good of man. And so you need to discern because there's so much out there. Uh, you know, my, my husband calls it a buffet. He says to me, there's a buffet out there. <laughs> and so you have this variety of, you know, I'm not sure, meditations, online sessions, talks, blah, 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 all happening. And the problem with us, especially Indians, and no, no offense to anybody there, but for us, when we go for a buffet, we have to try everything. 
Yes, if there's Chinese, we have to try the Chinese food. If there's Italian, we have to try the Italian food. Uh, if there's uh, North Indian, we have to try North Indian, South Indian food, everything. Right? And dessert, we have to try everything as well. Yeah, right. So the problem is by the end of it, can you digest all that? That's the point. <laughs> uh, so you have to discern to figure out if there is this huge thing out there. What is it that I need? What is it that I can digest and is good for me? And then you take only that. Yes. Uh, so you choose what you want in your life because sometimes you take all this and then you're going to just eat it all up and then just go to the loo in the morning. That's <laughs> now, you won't remember the taste of any of that food um, because you've eaten so much. Yeah. So try and discern and see what works for you, what helps you before you choose to go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my answer is not everyone, uh, because we are Hatha Yogis, are going to go together, crossing over and going to the next chain. It really depends on what each of us do. Yeah. And that's not just because we are Hatha Yogis. Anybody on the spiritual path, we just happen to be one, uh, if you can call one tribe that's walking on, on that path. Okay. Could you say who is God Yehoshua Ba Miriam? Um, He's not God. Uh, God for me is only the supreme being who I refer to as God. Yehoshua Bar Miriam is, Yehoshua is actually Lord Jesus. Jesus. Bar Miriam is the son of Mary. Yes. So Yehoshua Bar Miriam basically means uh, the son of Mary who is called Yehoshua. That is his original name. And the anglicized name is what they call Jesus. I hope that helps. Thank you. Okay. Has all... Has all the life on earth and all the kingdoms come down from the lunar incarnation? No, they're still coming. Uh, the fourth round is still happening, right? So many of the people from the first round are still coming. The first round of the moon chain are still coming. Can we do an annual tithing instead of monthly? Uh, Anjali, uh, it's like this. When you do a, a yearly tithing, yes, and you have 12 months. So the month that you did it, uh, there is a lot of good karma. And so even if there's negative karma, you don't feel anything. <clears throat> yes. But as this karma starts to decrease and as the other karma starts to increase, you'll suddenly notice that in the latter part of your life, life's, uh, latter part of the year, uh, life starts becoming difficult because there's not enough good karma to handle uh, what you would call the negative karma manifesting at that point. Yeah. Sorry. Excuse me. So my suggestion is uh, to do regular monthly tithing. The amount is not important. The regularity is. So then when you tithe and there is something, then again, the next month, then you tithe again, then tithe. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be so bad. Maybe one month it's bad. Then again, you caught up. So it helps. Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Something is bothering my nose. Excuse me. All right. Okay, now in case I don't answer everything today, I'm sure on Monday I can. Tomorrow we're not going to be meeting because I want you to listen to Master Danny tomorrow. So uh, please enjoy the session with Master Danny tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to end. It's almost 20 minutes past uh, the hour for our session. <clears throat> so tomorrow, please uh, continue with Master Danny. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful session. It's going to be about the Guru. So those of you who are Hatha Yogis, please join. For the rest of you, for the re remaining part of this uh, chapter and for more questions, we'll come back uh, on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> All right, people. Let's close our eyes. Connect down to your palate. Inhale and exhale. Relax the body. Let's say a thank you to the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chua Koksri, to Lord Maha Guruji Mailing, to all the great ones, to all the invisible and spiritual helpers, the beings of knowledge, light and power, especially of the communication and our respective Wi-Fi to our soul and divine self. We thank you all for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance and protection. We especially thank you for the priceless teachings, for all the knowledge, for all the wisdom, for all the clarity, and especially for your tremendous patience with us. Help us to absorb and assimilate this and use it to become better souls, better instruments for you to use. Thank you, and in full faith, with gratitude, respect, and love, thank you. All right, everybody, I'm going to see you on uh, Monday. And then maybe after a week or so, uh, we might start. Uh, we're looking at doing etheric double as uh, requested by you and many others actually before this. And uh, so we're going to start that. 
And to help me with, with the sessions, uh, Amit Dar, the, who's also my husband, will be joining. So he would like to also give uh, part of the information from the healing perspective. Because honestly, unlike me, uh, I do not have the luxury of healing on a regular basis. He continues to heal. And uh, his teachings, uh, when he met with Master Chua, being from uh, the other side, which is, I'm talking about the East and the West. So since he came from the West, uh, that is America, a lot of his teachings, uh, especially healing, which Master Chua would practice with them, didn't, wasn't done with us here in India. Yes, there were no techniques given to us. Uh, th there was not a lot of discussions about healing. But he was very lucky uh, to have Master Chua answer a lot of these questions. And um, he, he was someone who wrote it all down. Yes, and so he said when, when he joins us, he'd like to add that aspect. Of course, we will also talk about the etheric double. And in relation to whatever is mentioned there, whatever he remembers, what Master Chua shared about healing with reference to the etheric body or the etheric double or the energy body is what you will get. Yeah. So um, hopefully we'll be able to do that. We might have to take a break in between. I'm sorry, because um, our son has his holidays coming up. And we need to really uh, give him some time. He, he does complain that I'm away for about five hours. <laughs> he said, because it takes about a couple of hours for me to prepare and do my PowerPoint and, uh, and then actually do this talk with you guys and go back. So he says, mom, you go away for five hours. He complained even today. So I said, okay, I will take a one week break. So I'm there with him. He's still at school. Uh, but post that uh, in June, he has holidays, June and July. So during that time, we'll figure out how we're going to work. Another thing, uh, when we start off with the week after, we won't be doing it every day. Yes, uh, so we'll be doing it on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday only, maybe three times a week. We'll see how it is. It's a heavier book than this book. So I would request you to kindly uh, get a copy so it becomes easier for you to refer. So maybe we can do, like the first chapter is only about eight pages. But maybe, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm definite that it's going to take two sessions, but maybe it'll take more than two sessions, right? So each chapter, and there are 25 chapters, maybe not possible this year. <laughs> you know, we've, we've cramped up this because we have the luxury of, honestly, the lockdown. But uh, with life changing, I'm not sure what, what our prime minister is going to say tomorrow, but with life changing as it should, it may not be possible for you and me to you know, slot this time out every time. And so I'd like to space it out a little bit more, but a lot more work for you to start reading it. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you, everybody. Atma Namaste, good night. Enjoy your dinner, enjoy your Sunday. I will see you only on Monday. Bye. So all your questions, uh, there are about, oh my God, there are 72. I hope it's only thank yous. <laughs> So from here, there are 72. Uh, those of you who have questions, please copy them and paste them on, to, on Monday. Uh, so hopefully I will have the opportunity and uh, we'll be able to answer all your questions. Thank you. Atma. Namaste.